Hi, all greetings. Um, I'm Robert Twinker, and I run educational services and also was founder of Blockchain University some time back and was at PayPal before that. And looking at this space and seeing how it's evolved has been just tremendous since you know, the, the start of Bitcoin and the rise of Ethereum and such. And so as part of my other panelists' introductions, I'd like them to kind of explore what they saw at the time in, in say, 2015 as Ethereum was starting to emerge and what was the ecosystem like for them. Few companies were sort of raising money like the Ethereums and the Factums and Coinify and such. Um, how could you predict, could you imagine such an ecosystem as we have today where we have you know, massive fundraising in these types of technologies and such? So, I'd like to start with uh, Lindsay Moe to my left, and she can introduce herself and sort of comment about that early moment and a few years back and how it perhaps gave rose to this ecosystem and what they saw. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lindsay Moll, and I'm the CEO and founding partner of Luna Capital, which is a crypto asset fund that focus on, focuses on scalability and DAC technology. Uh, I was previously the head of cryptocurrency research um, at Precursor Ventures, which is an early stage VC firm. And I started getting in this space in 2013. I never really thought about it as a technology. I just thought about it as an investment vehicle at the time. So I that's really how I got into it. I had a lot of friends that actually used cryptocurrency as an exchange of goods. Um, it was actually quite a popular thing in college at the time. And I had been trading stocks and someone had introduced me to Poloniex. And then, yeah, Poloniex was the really popular exchange at one point that a lot of people used. And as time went on, it became really fascinating to watch all the news come out about technology and how the government started getting involved. And you could really tell that it was going to have an impact on society, but I never really knew how disruptive it would be today. Um, it's really interesting to see all of this grow and develop. But yeah, early in the days, I don't think a lot of us really knew what it would become or how fast it would become something. But also, Bitcoin was created almost 10 years ago. So you could also say it's been slow to really develop. And that's really my insight of how I got into the space. So Jay, you want to take it off? Sure. Um, Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jay Um. I'm a co-founder and managing director of TransLink Capital. TransLink is a traditional venture capital firm based in Palo Alto. Uh, the only twist that we have is myself and all my partners uh, formerly used to work and lead the US venture capital investments for big Asian tech companies. So I used to run Samsung Ventures, my partners did the same for SoftBank, Foxconn, UMC, Hikari Sushin, and collectively we work with a bunch of uh, strategic uh, corporations out in Asia, across Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China to bring Silicon Valley US technology uh, partnerships to them and invest in those companies. Um, my involvement in blockchain is almost by accident. So um, my day job is traditional venture capital, but uh, my hobby, I moonlight as an advisor and personal investor to early stage companies. Uh, one of the entrepreneurs that I had known for a number of years uh, visited my office back in, I want to say 2013 or so, uh, and he had a business plan talking about connecting uh, Korea uh, to the blockchain economy at the time by building the first ever Bitcoin exchange there. Uh, so I became one of the first advisors, uh, investors in Corbett, which ended up raising uh, a bunch of money uh, from folks like Tim Draper, Naval Ravikant, SB Angel, uh, and a bunch of other investors. SoftBank was one of them. And they uh, ultimately had a great exit last year when uh, Nexon, uh, the big gaming company based in Tokyo but uh, by a South Korean founder, uh, acquired the company. So because of our connections in Asia, uh, my perspective is a little more um, uh, focused on what developed in that part of the world. And uh, since 2013, as uh, many of you know, um, the ecosystem has really excelled quite nicely in certain pockets in, uh, in Asia, uh, namely in Korea, in Japan, in Hong Kong, Singapore. And um, the ecosystem, I would say, today, for many of those who probably have visited, uh, arguably is even stronger in certain ways because 
there's been actually aggressive early adoption from some of the larger corporations. Uh, literally every single big bank, uh, big corporation, hospital, university uh, in Korea, uh, for example, have blockchain projects that are going on. Um, some of the uh, leading ICO projects like ICON and others are actively working in production scale uh, by implementing blockchain in some of these uh, institutions and thus uh, working on scalability issues, security issues, real life problems that uh, ultimately need to be fixed in order for the blockchain to be adopted in the real world. So that's been my perspective so far. Hey guys. Hello, um, I'm Stuart Dennis. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Bitbounce. Bitbounce is a cryptocurrency spam solution. We put a paywall on your email inbox so that people that you don't know have to pay a cryptocurrency fee in order to deliver their emails to you. Uh, we have over 300,000 active users. Uh, Tim Draper is our main backer for the company and our token, and we held a successful ICO late last year where we raised 31,000 Ether. It was worth $11.3 million uh, at the time, and we've been growing since then. <laughs> in terms of the specific question, so I look at things both from a developer and an entrepreneur standpoint. And in 2015, we actually came up with the, or the idea for BitBounce was first proposed. Um, and uh, we didn't actually move forward with it until the start of 2017. And I think that was for a couple reasons. One, uh, it was uh, from the developer standpoint, it was much harder to develop substantive applications at that time. You know, Ethereum hadn't really, uh, you know, building on top of Bitcoin, um, it really is not great for support of, of smart contracts in the same way as Ethereum or another platform like Stellar. It was just much harder to do. And uh, then also from a, um, uh, and, uh, whereas now, Ethereum, it makes implementation far easier. From an entrepreneurial standpoint, the ICO boom hadn't really uh, picked up yet, and so it was much harder to access capital. Uh, whereas we came in, I felt like right at the sweet spot where uh, it was easy to access capital, the barriers hadn't really gone up nearly as high as they are even now, um, and development was much easier. Um, and so I think when I look back at that earlier time, basically the barrier to development and accessing capital was much higher. That led to far fewer substantive uh, projects in the space, fewer development talent there, and that's all uh, improved dramatically since then. Interesting. So in terms of the ICO space, I'd like to start off with a question around enterprises' interests in ICOs. You've probably heard, you know, Kodak was trying, or maybe still trying to do, I think, an ICO, and they have a separate website now talking about their potential ICO for um, tracking the provenance of photographs and things of that nature. Uh, Long Island Ice Tea renamed themselves the Long, Long Blockchain, and their stock price doubled, and they were gonna do an ICO, but uh, apparently they, had, they missed their filing date for their annual report, and a number of other things, their stock has been going down, and I think the SEC is prohibiting them from doing this ICO. Uh, there's other organizations that, like Kick, Kick Messenger is uh, probably the most well-known one doing an ICO that um, seems like it may succeed. Uh, uh, probably a reference point there might be the Telegram ICO, just kind of in terms of, of what they're doing and trying to accomplish. Um, so that, you know, from that framework, what do you think are potential opportunities for companies to do, say, reverse ICOs, um, to have some kind of listing of either their company stock or some project within their company or some um, open source project they might be doing, for instance, um, relative to you know, medium to large sized companies. And we'll start with Lindsay. Yeah, that's a great question. So I think I always remember that ICO is just a funding mechanism. And then you have um, the blockchain, which is supposed to be something that one isn't completely really developed yet. And the reverse ICOs that you're talking about, like Kin and um, these companies that are raising when they've already been a company for a few years, a lot of the time they see it as maybe an exit opportunity as well for VCs. Uh, for my fun Luna, we don't do too many investments for reverse ICOs. I really think that the most successful companies will be the ones that are coming out new in this space instead of the ones that are ICOing 
because of the opportunity. However, I don't think it's a terrible thing. I think ICOs can be used for many great purposes where a lot of people don't have access to VCs or capital across the world that want to build something great. And it could potentially save a company. Uh, we haven't really seen much of that yet. I think it's so early on to really tell where these tokens, ICO world will really go. The area right now is just so gray. Um, but I, I think that Kin came in at the right time. It's still really early on to see or tell which ICOs will do well and when to come in and do an ICO as well. So I think any company should even consider it um, to think about it. It's not a bad thing to think about it. Thanks. Yeah, I, I, well, I'd add from a motivation standpoint, uh, established companies still need capital from time to time, or a lot of them do. So you see companies selling corporate bonds, post uh, uh, IPO offerings of equity, uh, that kind of thing. This is a new asset class that they could offer if they need additional capital. And then I think in terms of the opportunity for them is, do they have an established network that could benefit from being tokenized or adding a token in um, and unlock the value that way? And I think some companies like Telegram are being quite opportunistic in a good way around that uh, with the opportunity of their active user base. And I think you'll see other established companies uh, move in and, and do likewise uh, for too long. Uh, so I can speak for the private company side. Um, for example, uh, Kick Messenger is a company that uh, I've known for many years. Um, they talked to us for funding prior to this. And um, you know, some of our LPs include some of the largest messaging platforms like Line and Kakao. And we've also invested in a popular messaging platform called Tango as well. Um, the reality is um, having a large active user base obviously is critical. Uh, but monetization varies. So if you have a heavy concentration in any particular geo and you're the dominant messaging platform there, then monetization is relatively easier and you can do quite well. And this is WeChat, this is Line, this is Kakao. Uh, but if you're not as concentrated and your user base has multiple options and the monetization then mechanism becomes a lot harder. So the way that I understood Kick, uh, not revealing any of the specific financials, is while they had an active user base, they were having challenges in monetization. And thus, they were having challenges in fundraising. And so credit to them, uh, they moved very quickly before the stringency in terms of ICOs and regulation actually hit. And they were able to do a very successful ICO very timely. I would say the same with Telegram, even more successful and uh, well-organized. Um, as, um, as they did their ICO. The reality is, um, since my day job is working with uh, equity-funded startups, um, most of the companies that I'm involved in have had at least one or more conversation about looking at an ICO as a potential financing opportunity. There's many pros and cons that you can consider. Uh, the biggest pro, ideally, when ICOs were hot and literally you know, business plans, so to speak, or white papers and a founding team uh, with not even a proof of concept was able to get funding. Some of these companies have established teams, they have uh, corporate governance, they have a product that's being used out there. And so relatively speaking, the bar for them actually is lower to raise an ICO. The challenge is twofold. One is because of the regulatory environment becoming much more stringent these days, there is potential risk of these established companies to go down a path of an ICO and ultimately not achieve that goal and invite regulatory um, uh, constraints that they may not consider a productive exercise. In fact, in many ways, that could be a distraction, number one. And number two, um, in terms of the potential mechanics of an ICO, especially in the US because of the stringency, um, a lot of these companies have to run their day job, run their products and platforms and they don't necessarily have the resources to execute and deliver properly on an ICO. So that's the general situation. What's happening, though, in Asia is different. So not surprisingly, because of the lesser regulatory contingency, ICOs are very popular now, especially for established companies. In fact, it's more likely for an established company now to raise an ICO successfully than one with literally just a team and a white paper. And so that activity is still very, very active right now, and it continues to grow. Uh, my personal view is that 
you know, if you can execute properly and raise capital on an ICO, you should go for it. There's really no reason not to consider it. But if you have other considerations, including regulatory, including your current business, then it becomes a lot harder and there's a big trade-off there. Can you give us an example of one of those companies that is established that is doing an ICO? Yeah, um, there's a, a company that um, I'm familiar with. So this is a company that, interestingly enough, is based in the U.S., started by a Korean founder, and they offer basically um, a platform where people can offer their services either as tour guides, um, uh, music lesson teachers, uh, dog walkers, etc., and provide kind of a, a shared economy platform where they connect basically as a marketplace buyers and sellers of those services. Um, I think we're familiar with a lot of these platforms. Uh, this particular company, because they started relatively later than some of the more established companies, uh, where it was able to raise around the seed capital, but their growth was not as accelerated because, again, there was a lot of competition, they weren't able to raise massive rounds of financing to do the marketing, and so they languished somewhat. What they decided to do is they actually went uh, back, so the founder was Korean, he went back to the home country, um, and he got involved with some of the early platform <coughs> out there, uh, like Icon. And so they were one of the first uh, distributed app companies that were to build on the Icon protocol. And they were able to raise, um, I think it's somewhere between 25 and $30 million uh, in terms of accessible ICO. This, this startup, which I know well, uh, was having trouble raising a $3 million Series A. Did they do an ERC-20 token? Um, actually, no, they built it on Icon. So uh, the Icon platform actually promoted them and actually put them in front of many Icon investors, and that's the reason that they were successful fundraising. Fantastic. Great. So in 2016, you probably all know there were just uh, some of the 50 or 60 ICOs, that, that uh, maybe hundreds, hun some hundred or so ICOs that happened, and um, there was just a, a not, not a lot of fun fundraising. About 60 ICOs and around 100 million in, in fundraising. But in 2017, the, the number of ICOs uh, went into around 200 or so, but over $400 billion was raised. I mean, it's just massive how that is hockey stick in terms of the investment. So um, just kind of a general question for the panelists in terms of, you know, based on the, the title of this talk, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So just maybe, you know, one example of, of something great or bad or just terribly ugly. Um, maybe it's first, Lindsay. I think now expectations, well, last year expectations were really high by the end of the year, and people are still investing as if it was 2017, Q3, Q4. And that's going to be difficult now because of you know regulations coming in and people are slowing down. A lot of um, companies are doing a one-year lockup because what if they do potentially become a security, but also they don't want people manipulating their token. Um, in regards to that, the bad, I would say, is that most of the investors in this market are really impatient and they could be scared off and maybe you could potentially see slow growth um, in the near future. But I do think that it will maybe potentially hockey stick again. I think people need to be more comfortable with the fact that more legitimacy is coming to the space. And as an investor in technology, I think that's really important to see this develop in an exponential way instead of just a really speculative um, investment. Because maybe you could see it go up a lot greater than it did last year. <laughs> last year, a lot of people were just investing left and right. And people still do that. Maybe not in the US, but where there are lower um, regulations in other countries. If you step outside of the US, a lot of people are waiting to throw their money into these ICOs. So it's still happening. It's slowing down in the US, but um, I think that is to come to see. Do you have a favorite ICO? No, I don't have a favorite ICO. I have a favorite project, <laughs> which is Hashgraph. And uh, that's a DAG. I direct is a cyclic graph, which is a non blockchain cryptocurrency. And you could really compare that to private blockchains or maybe Ripple, because 
they're going to be acting on an industry level. Um, they claim to be more decentralized than blockchain, even though it's not a blockchain. It's basically decentralizing centralization um, exponentially more. And they've been developing this product project over the last five-ish years, and just really, really talented team. And they've been heads down for the last few years, and now they're really coming out of the out of the shadows. And they've pretty much been the hot topic for the last few months. And I met them at TechCrunch and really saw a lot of potential, especially after seeing the hackathon and a lot of developers start really thinking and building on top of it. So scalability, I think, is one of the really, really important things to think about. We're not even really close to seeing blockchain come to what it can become, what it should become, or what Satoshi really wanted it to be yet. Um, so much development and infrastructure needs to happen before these companies and projects are able to become legitimate companies and become really scalable over time. So they renamed this Hedera Hashtag. Hedera Hashtag, yeah. And they, so they had the hackathon. They also have about 20 somewhat projects working with them and all. Um, some supply chain, I think some healthcare. Yeah, yeah. any yeah. interesting projects that are working on Hedera? But uh, there's a stable works. coin that's working on top of Hedera. I think it's, I really like looking at protocol layers and one of the most obvious reasons to me why I think it will succeed as a project overall is because they've gotten so many developers to want to build on it. And you see other projects, they have to pay developers a lot of money to develop on top of it. Whereas, you know, you could, with Ethereum, a lot of developers are easily building on top of it. Most of the ICOs that happened last year developed on top of Ethereum. And I think that we're going to see a lot of these protocol layers, and some of them not do anything. But if you see that developer community become attracted to it and interested and start building on top of it, um, regardless of what uh, PR media says, I think that's a really good indicator as to what a successful project will become in the future. Cool, thanks. James Stewart? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the good is, I think this is exciting. I think this is disruptive. I see kind of the spread of, there's obviously the early adopters that were believers in the blockchain. It's exciting to see more mainstream on the engineering side. Um, <clears throat> I'm part of a syndicate with a bunch of Facebook product managers and engineers, and uh, there's a lot of excitement from some of these mainstream engineers out of Facebook, Google, Uber, etc., that are now kind of jumping into some of these opportunities. So I think it's becoming more mainstream. I see the same on the investor side. I think there were some early believers, uh, Union Square, Andreessen, and a few others uh, that were active uh, lookingly, uh, looking at the blockchain, even investing in tokens and ICOs. Um, I will tell you pretty much every venture capital firm, including ours that I know, this year has gotten either permission or in the process of getting permission from our limited partners to be able to invest in tokens. So it's be going to become more uh, widespread and it's going to become more extreme. And that's exciting. So I think that's the good news. <clears throat> I think the bad slash ugly, I, I combine the two, is the reality is that some of these um, projects that are able to have successful ICOs um, are very early stage companies. It's The analogy is it's like a... 11-year-old getting access to the parents' car keys in the Lamborghini and the credit card and going night on the town. And not every project obviously is like that, but there's a number of projects that I'm quite familiar with that um, because of a lack of experience and lack of maturity, after they've raised the ICO, they realize now they actually have to build something. So if you think about it, ICO is just the first step. It's the first fundraising step. The second step is to build the product or the platform, and the third step is to build a business on top of that. Um, in many cases, this is like a pre-seed stage company raising a series B or a C round type of financing. And if you don't have the experience to manage those resources properly, to be able to allocate in the right way and not get carried away that you've just raised $20 million, then a lot of, I would say, ugly activity happens especially because a lot of these startup uh, projects do not have a proper corporate governance. So there's a management team without a board that has no control, no reporting responsibilities, 
to their token holders slash shareholders, and thus uh, the potential of things going wrong. And I think everybody is aware of some of the projects that really fell apart and blew up, or people just you know ran away overnight. I, I saw an article about a project in Vietnam that raised 30 million, and the entire founding team has left the country. I mean, the potential of abuse is, is, is much larger because of the lack of checks and controls that have been, been established over decades in the traditional startup space. A couple minutes? Yeah, no, no. I'd say the, the worst thing is scams. There's a lot of scams in the space, and i just give one example here. After we did our pre-sale, we had another project give the exact uh, launch with the exact same name. They had a slightly different website. It was Credo Desk. Uh, they did a bunch of things uh, to get on listing websites, on like Coin uh, Market Cap. Um, it created a lot of fud and confusion in our space. I had people saying, "Hey, is this the same project? Why do you have the same name?" Then they contacted me asking for a payment to change their name. We obviously said no and just kind of continued on, and then and you know ended up completing our successful uh, fundraise. Uh, but then uh, I looked at their website not that long after that, and they shut down. And they just said, our token sale has been discontinued permanently, but they'd raised a fair amount of, uh, of ether uh, from people who were confused. I even had someone contact us from our Telegram group who said, hey, um, uh, is this your website, Credo CF? And he bought their tokens, and he said, I thought I was with you guys the whole time. So it's a, a real shame when that kind of thing happens. That said, uh, the, I think the good thing is that a lot of projects that might not have been funded otherwise are now able to get uh, access to capital. Some of these ones that are, I'd say, censorship susceptible, uh, or ones that uh, established institutions might not uh, uh, like to back, um, I think are able to, uh, such as anonymizing technologies, are able to easily access capital. And then it's also easy, uh, easier for established uh, or for other projects to get capital. So we were in a similar situation to that other company where I was looking at raising a Series A. Our main investor, Tim Draper, said he could put a million in, into that round. Uh, but I did fact about uh, the token sale opportunity, and we went that route instead. Uh, my favorite ICO would have to be our own. Um, it's just, it's great, check it out. But actually, I, I really like the basic attention token, which I participated in. Um, they're doing something similar to us. They're tokenizing attention through a web browser instead of email. Well, thanks. That's um, ICOs, good, bad, and ugly from both the uh, kind of startup side as well as the corporate side. Please join me in uh, thanking Mark Hamill.